Matthew 5 to 7 last uh, two weeks ago. And we just look at uh, Matthew 5 to 7 as equivalent to Proverbs or to the book of Proverbs. We introduce what kingdom life is. <clears throat> then we look at all those uh, blessed passages or the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. And uh, we ended looking at believers as salt and light. And, and so, having mentioned all of those, we believe that uh, one of the main arguments today that is being discussed is, is the law is still alive? Is there still a uh, room for the law? Now, we mentioned, for example, that some of these items in the law were repeated in the New Testament. They are not put in order like first commandment, second commandment, third commandment. But, for example, Paul said, <clears throat> honor your parents or have debt of gratitude. That's in the Ten Commandments. It, it uh, prohibits sexual immorality and sexual misconduct. That is in the area of adultery. So everything was mentioned. And of course, along with that, a lot of things are being mentioned about tithes and offering as the main discussion. But we will look now at kingdom life or being a believer and our relationship with the law. Now, remember this. We are not Jewish. Say I'm not Jewish. <laughs> Unless you're Jewish, then don't, don't read what I just said, okay? We're not Jewish. We're, we're Gentiles. Jews have certain blessings and certain restrictions. For example, as if, if, if a person is a strict Jew, there are certain food <clears throat> they cannot eat. They cannot eat catfish. They cannot eat... Uh, other seafood, they cannot eat pork. Huh? Do you guys love pork? What about pork and beans? You know, I uh, I know that when they serve hamburgers, they cannot ha serve ham hamburger with 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 cheese. Why? Because you don't eat the hamburger or the meat. Well, it's nursing its kid. Okay, so you don't mix the two. But if you're a Gentile, who cares? You know, we, we eat everything. And so there are certain prohibitions that are given to Gentiles that are not given to the Jews, that are given to the Jews, they're not given to the Gentiles. So the believers started getting saved. In Acts chapter 15, they begin to have an argument. And certain restrictions were given. You don't worship, you don't, uh, you don't worship uh, idols, of course. You avoid sexual immorality. But practically, that's about it. You know, in fact, there is, the Acts 15 happened before the book of Mark. And the book of Mark, basically, Jesus allowed us to eat anything. You know, so anything that moves, you can eat the Jews don't have that. And so now Christians begin to argue saying, well, there is no more room for the law. Now, there are some problems that it poses. For example, how do we live now? Because we are saved by grace, can we commit adultery? Can we, uh, can we avoid certain things that are of moral nature? Okay, we were, we're going to discuss that tonight, okay? Let's start with chapter 5. Verse 17. Now this is Jesus. Supposedly this is New Testament. Okay? But of course this is still under the Old Testament because Jesus has not died and risen from the grave yet. But let's observe chapter 5 starting on verse 17. Don't think, this is, this is Jesus talking, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. So Jesus did not come to abolish the Lord of Prophets. That's New Testament. That's a very clear statement. I did not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. 
So he did not, not only did he say, I'm not abolishing it, he said, I am coming to fulfill it. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Has the heavens and the earth already passed away? Huh? No. Therefore, none of this is, has, has passed away. When will the heavens and the earth pass away? Will it ever pass away? Guys, wake up now. I know I'm sleepy, but will it ever pass away? Yes and no. Where there, there, there will come a time there will be new heavens and the new earth. And so all of this will be abolished. But not now. Okay? And the Bible says that uh, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Not one jot or tittle. Therefore, whoever breaks, look at this, therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, let's make some initial observations. First, Jesus, Jesus did not come to abolish the law. To abolish means to destroy. He did not come to say, well, it's a futile. It has no meaning. He did not say that. Now remember that God is the author of the law. And God did not make any mistakes. And so for people to say, well, the law is a mistake, then you're saying God made a mistake. And God did not give Caprius commands and say, oops, it was wrong. You know, so Jesus said, I did not come to destroy it or to abolish it or to render it null and void. That's what it means. Instead, it is the exact opposite. He came to fulfill the law. What does fulfill mean? What? To meet? accomplish or oh, let's just reverse it to fulfill means huh? to fully fill that's what fulfill means to fill fully why because when the law was given to us we are measured against the law and was found one thing it was only Jesus Christ who fully feel the requirements of the law so he fulfilled the law. Okay, so not only did he obey the law, he left none of it unobeyed or unfulfilled. He fully observed the whole law. That's why Jesus observed the Sabbath. Jesus went to Jerusalem at least three times a year because of the feasts. Jesus wore, including... Uh, how to the cheat cheat, you know, when the Bible says, the woman says, if I can only touch the hem of his garment, that's, that's the cheat cheat that, that, uh, that they wore, the one with, with uh, how, how, how do you call the thing? Uh, the one with several strings. Uh-huh. Tassels, yeah, the tassels. So the woman says, if I can only touch the tassels of his garment, because the tassels represents the word of God or the commandments of the Lord. If I may only touch it, I will be healed. So Jesus wore that, you know. And he observed ceremonial laws, the, the, the ritual cleansing and all of those things. In other words, throughout his life on earth, he fulfilled what the law uh, demands. Now, through this, we can understand some of the passages in the New Testament, like what the law could not do, he did. You know, For example, the law could not justify anybody. Why? Because we violate the law. 
He who lives by the law should, should observe every aspect of the law. In fact, if you violate one, one portion of the law, you are guilty of all. <clears throat> In other words, when he fulfilled it, <coughs> he fully satisfied its requirements. The second observation is, everything in the law will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not a smallest letter in the law will pass away. Now today, majority of Christians hopes, hope and teaches that the law already passed away. A lot of Christians today, they, they, they wish that. Jesus said, it will not pass away. Jesus said, it did not. Now, what, what aspects of the law, we may say, passed away? Is there any aspect of the law that passed away? Hmm. What? The sacrificial, the substitutionary work of Christ. But the, I will follow up with this question. Did it really pass away? John, did it pass away? Why it did not? Why is it that the blood of animals, of bulls and goats, has to be sacrificed every year? Why? Hmm? Why, why every year? Why is it that the blood has to be sprinkled on the murder seat every year? Because it cannot wash away sins. It can only cover it. Meaning, if I, if I wash, if my, if my clothes are dirty, wouldn't it be fun, for example, if you have a detergent, that the moment they wash, your clothes are washed, it will never be dirty again? Huh? If you have a washing machine, that the moment you put your clothes in it to wash it, no matter what happened, it will never be dirty again. Won't you love that kind of uh, machine? I know my wife would love it. But the fact is, you keep wearing your clothes, you put it in the washing machine because it keeps being dirty. But if there is a machine, if there is a detergent, that the moment you wash your clothes, it will never be dirty again. Do you need to put it in again? Was the effect of that everlasting detergent is still going on? It will still be going on. So why is it that Jesus doesn't need to be sacrificed again? Because his blood washed away our sins. It doesn't need to be washed again. Therefore, it is fulfilled. It doesn't mean it has no more effect. Okay. That's why it's called the substitutionary aspect of the law. However, there are aspects of the law that are of human fulfillment. For example, honor your father and your mother. This, because this is the first commandment with a promise. Do you, are we allowed now to disrespect our parents? Are we under the law? We are not. The Bible says we are, no, we are not under the law. Because Jesus fulfilled it. But we are required from the commandments of Paul to be under means we never grew up. Now, have you ever, guys, learned how to read? When did you learn how to read? Did you learn the basics of math? When did you learn that? We learned that in, in the house. <laughs> we learned that when we were young, right? We were taught one plus one equals. Are you guys still thinking what the answer is? We graduated from that, but its effect is still going on in our lives. We mature, we grew, therefore we don't need to keep enrolling on the first grade. So that is what happened to us in terms of the law. It doesn't mean we ignore it. 
what it means is we fulfilled it. We fulfilled the requirements. And so only the substitutionary aspect of that law that Christ fulfilled has been finished. It doesn't need to be repaid again. But it doesn't mean it has no, no more effect. Some of the law are only for the Jews. Just, you cannot claim them as sure as, as Gentile believers. For example, in the Jewish law, they are supposed to, every seven years, on the seventh year, they are not supposed to harvest from their fields. Meaning on the seventh year, I can go to a Jewish field and pick whatever produce it has. And they are not supposed to complain. In fact, I'm not even supposed to ask for permission because it's not theirs that year. It's the Lord's. And so the Lord is giving it to everybody, to the poor, to the widow, to the orphans. And so do we do that? Uh, can you imagine if you own a business on the seventh year, whatever profit it has, you will not get. Of course, nobody will, 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 uh, will agree on that one. That is not, that is only for the Jews. Not even, in fact, even the Jews are not doing it. Oh, by the way, some of you went with me to Israel. God prophesied that the temple will be rebuilt. And they call it the second temple. Actually, it's technically, you can call it the third temple or even the fourth temple. But it's a temple that will be rebuilt. What will they do in the temple? God says it will be rebuilt. What will the Jews do in the temple? Will they dorm there? Huh? What will they do in the temple? Do Old Testament requirements. And God prophesied it. If that is done, then they don't have to, God doesn't have to allow them to rebuild it. Is that for the Gentiles? No. But that will, in fact, the Antichrist will desecrate the temple. So there are certain aspects of the law that will still be fulfilled, that will still happen in the future. In context, Jesus was still addressing the Jews during, the, 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 during this time when he taught the Beatitudes. And so he was addressing the religious elite. So let's look, let's look at, the, at this aspect of the law from that perspective that Jesus was addressing the religious elites and the Jews and they apply them today. When Jesus assured them that not the smallest letter or one stroke or, or letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished, he was addressing the spiritual state of the nation. There was the temple rebuilt by Herod. Is everything in the temple? Herod rebuilt, in fact, he made it even higher. Okay, from the size of uh, Solomon, when Herod rebuilt the temple, it was higher. The, the courtyards were even better. It's more luxurious, you know. It doesn't have all the golds, of course. But my question is, when Herod rebuilt the temple, was everything there? Why no? Was everything there? What is missing? The Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant was, was not there. It was missing. It was hidden. You know? It was missing. It was hidden. They don't know where it was. In fact, uh, in the Temple Institute that we visited, it says there that they know exactly where it is. It's a very, it's a very uh, encouraging news to know that they know exactly where it is. But I'm not sure they know what they're talking about. How do I know that they're not sure what they're talking about in the Temple Institute? If they know where it is, it should have been there in the Second Temple. When he would rebuilt it, they should have put it there. But the fact that it's not there puts question in my head, do they really know where it is? You see, <clears throat> those are just basic uh, deduction. But say they, they know where it is. In the second temple, the Ark of the Covenant was not there. Okay, it was not there. But supposedly when the temple is rebuilt, it will be there. And uh, sacrifice will, will, will be made. 
And so while they were bragging about the temple, it was very incomplete. What religious people does is look also, because, you know, this is, this is the problem that, that we have even today. Who are the main violators of the law, for example, in the U.S.? The one who wrote it. You know, they, they know exactly how to go around it. And you know what, what they say is the worst drug addicts are those in the medical profession, especially the doctors. When a doctor becomes addicted, it's the worst addict. Why? They can prescribe. You know, they can, they can cheat on these medications. They know how to do it. They have friends. They have connections. So they say that the, when, when a person becomes a fear, for example, fear of drug addiction, the doctors were supposed to be the worst. Yeah. Now, having, ha- having said that, when, when Jesus was teaching this, the religious leaders were saying, you have to follow the law. But Jesus is saying, no, you don't mean that because you're violating it. Uh, they're abusing people during that time. Accusations, we can, we can illustrate with the accusations of politicians, accusations of ministers to others, accusations of Christians to fellow believers. Have you noticed Christians are more strict against fellow Christians? Yeah. Have you noticed parents whose eyes are not open are more strict to their children? Because what they are very strict to their children, they are guilty of. Like, like for example, some parents are very strict. Hey, get on a straight A. Hey, if these kids will just have the guts, why don't you ask your parents, how was your grade? You know, they, they, are, they are trying to, some, some parents who could not uh, finish a degree, forcing their kids to finish that degree. You know, that's my dream. Well, that, that was your dream. That's not mine. But they'll be forcing their kids to fulfill the dream. And so that becomes a problem. Most of the time, we are guilty of, uh, we are very strict against others for what we are guilty of. There is an orphanage in the Philippines, in Pasig. Uh, in, in Pasig. They were wondering why the priests in that orphanage are very mean to children. You know, um, they're, they're just mean to children. They'll, they'll beat up on the children. Well, some, some un, unofficial investigation was made. It turned out a lot of those children were children of priests from the nuns. You know. So what happened is the reason why they're very strict is they're looking at their kids. And every time they look at their kids, what are they looking at? They're looking at their sins. And so they're very strict with, this, with these kids because some of them wish they, uh, these kids are dead. Have you ever wondered why there's so much abortion in the world today? Now, now so, some kids will really be aborted. But you know why... why, why uh, why uh, abortion is very popular, especially among those who doesn't have moral issues, mor- moralities rather, is because those kids are reminders of their sins. And because they are reminders of their sins, they also prohibits them from fulfilling their sins. Or for kids become a new ones to them. They could no longer do whatever they want to do because these kids, uh, what? And, and, uh, yeah, and these kids will prevent me from having my liberty. What about my rights? What about my freedom? That's why those kids are reminders of their sins. So they, they, they hate those kids. Can you imagine this, this ridiculous law now that they passed in, I think in, in West Virginia wherein upon birth the mother can still decide to abort the baby. How can you abort somebody who was already born? It's murderous, you see. In their days, there was a, uh, prior to that, there was, one of the successors of Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, desecrated the temple and the law. They, he forced Jews to eat pigs and to sacrifice pigs in the temple. 
And so now, the religious leaders begin to uh, criticize that. But you know what they did? They begin, they begin to run the business in the temple. Money, they run the Western Union, you know, the, the currency exchange. They, they run that. That's why Jesus turned the tables of money changers and those who sell doves. Because the priests run those business. And Jesus, the accusation of Jesus was this. The, his charge was this. This is a house of prayer. You turn it into den of thieves. The priests were guilty of that. You see? And so, that was still in play. Now you say, well, and so we criticize, we criticize the, uh, the, the priests, right? Why, why, did you, why did you guys do that? Now, let's, let's turn to the 21st century in our time. We do the same thing. We turn the church, some churches, not ours, of course. We, some churches uh, turn their church into networking business. I mean, it, it be, remember that case in the Philippines? I forgot where it was in the south. Where in the pastor promised you pay your tithe and you will have something like 20% uh, return every, every month or something. Christians criticized the Pharisees for overcharging over this, this uh, money changing, which the law allows. Because if you're traveling from Babylon or Rome, and, uh, the silver is different, and you can't bring uh, animals. It, will, it may die during the trip. So you buy it in Jerusalem. And the priests begin to raise these animals. They begin to run this business. Now, that's why we have to be very careful. In, in the church, we may be guilty of doing the same thing. Uh, Brother, Willie, Brother Willie's wife was uh, running some, some business before insurance. And so I asked him, how do you apply uh, the word to what you're doing? He, he, he told me this. He said, if somebody approached Sister Cherry in the church and said, Sister Cherry, here is my payment for the insurance and the church. Sister Cherry will say, no, I won't accept it. If you want to pay the insurance, we have to finish the service. And you don't pay me in the church. Well, let's meet outside. Because really some churches have converted the house of worship into den of thieves. And have to be extremely careful on that one. Okay. So you cannot... Uh, you cannot uh, break the law and teach others not to break it. Now, Jesus demonstrates this desecration of the word with these sayings. You heard, but I say unto you. Now, that series of teaching tells a lot about our relationship with the word of God. Let's, let's look at verse 19. Therefore, Whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. You cannot break and teach others to break the commandments. This is a warning. I've been, I've been teaching you guys. You violate something, you lose your rights unless you, you, you become honest. Have you, have you noticed adulterers, for example? They have difficulty teaching their kids to not commit adultery. You violate it. Now, does it mean you can no longer teach it? Of course you can teach it, but you have to come out clean. You, you have to you have to tell your kids, hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm an adulterer and uh, I almost break up our family, so I'm telling you right now, do not follow what I did. But how many parents will come out clean like that? Parents would like to come out superhuman beings in front of their children. You see? But it requires a lot of repentance to be able to regain some of this uh, trust. But the moment you are guilty of something, you lose the right in the Philippines, parents keep telling their kids, don't, don't smoke. Well, they are smoking. So you end up having kids at a very young age 
My, my father will tell me, do not smoke, Jose. He's a, he, he was a chain smoker. But the moment he starts getting drunk, he tells me to, 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 to light up the cigarettes for them. So he was telling me don't smoke, but I smoke all the time. <laughs> because, Jose, light this up. Do you think I'll just light it up? I'll smoke it a little bit and a little bit some more. And that's how I got started, you know. But, but, but uh, I, I, I put a break on it right away when I was in high school. But he, how, how can you tell me don't smoke when you're smoking in front of me? I may not light the cigarette, but if, if I'm around you, I'm smoking it still. Why? Secondhand smoke is even worse. You see, that's why we have to be careful with what we hear and what we say. Some of these applicable commandments include moral laws, gifts and sacrifices. You cannot you cannot uh, teach others to break these laws simply because you are guilty of violating it. Now, the other thing that happens is the moment you are guilty of violating something, you promote it to others. Yeah. You promote it to others. You begin to say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. Ray Willie was, was uh, illustrating to you guys when we were in L.A. I forgot when it was done. Azusa Street Centennial Celebration. So our group was lined up in, uh, I think it's the forum where the Lakers play. That's, that's where the celebration is. Oh, I forgot where it was. They were lined up. And I was late. I was with, I don't know, who, who were our kids during the time? Uh, James was with us. So James was with us. And you know how my wife is. She's very early all the time. <laughs> early for the next service, you know. Uh, but we were lined up, and, and the, uh, our people were already in the line. And you know, when the line is long, people get upset when you cut in. And so they saw me, they say, Hey, Pastor Jose, get in. Cut in. Well, I did not cut in. I went to, to, the, to the last why? Because, because uh, I, I was embarrassed with, with a lot of brothers and sisters who were there, and, and they, are, they, they are lined up. Therefore, I can, I can tell people to, to, to line up. You see what I'm saying? Now, are we perfect on that? No. But this is what I'm, what, what, what I'm saying. The moment you violate it, do not encourage others to violate it also, because then you become the least in the kingdom of heaven. You know, when somebody, for example, I'm, I'm telling you it's in the area of moral laws, if somebody tells you, oh, it's okay to commit adultery, it's, it's okay from time to time to sin like that, they are guilty. Okay, not only are they guilty, perhaps they have somebody in the family who is guilty. The moment somebody tells you, you don't have to pay your tithes, they are not tithing. And they are asking others to join them in their disobedience. Those who violate it are not allowed to teach it. Jesus spoke against these double standards. Worse, according to Paul, we look for others who will agree with our wickedness. That's why the Bible says we look for uh, teachers who can be bought you know, guilty of filthy lucre. Why we develop itching ears. You cannot live like unbelievers and expect to go to heaven. He said this, your righteousness should surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees. What is that? Religiosity. For example, you come Friday night, for example, or, or Sunday service. The devil can come to church. You can come to church and not mean it. Maybe your parents require you. Maybe your boyfriend requires you. Maybe your girlfriend requires you. Maybe your wife or your, maybe your spouse threatens to divorce you if you don't go to church. Therefore, you go there religiously. You have to surpass that. How do you surpass that? You must love coming to church. 
You must look forward to coming to church. You must come ready to worship. That's why David says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Some people react, ha, ah, Sunday in a month. You know, that's why some people keep negotiating how many, how many services they're going to come. Now, of course, we are, we are required clearly in the scriptures one day a week. But nobody does that anymore. You know, why? Because we come for the service two hours and that's it. We leave. But it's one day a week. Rest. And so what happened is we enjoin others to follow the same thing. Now, let's look at you heard I say. As we look at this next set of verses, I want you to observe that the emphasis of Jesus is you heard. Okay, you heard. Instead of say, saying you were taught, Jesus said, you heard, but I say unto you. He did not say you were taught. He said you heard. Why? All of us always choose what to hear. We choose what to hear. I, we could be saying something, but for example, Hansel, according to my prompting, I, because you know, if, if I didn't ask Hansel to do this, what will happen? Nobody will be in the center. I know why people avoid the center, they'll be sitting on the side. So I, I told Hansel uh, a few weeks ago, and, and he will tell people, uh, would you please compress? So what did Hansel say? What did Hansel say? Compress. Now, this is not a matter of sin, okay? This is a matter of my preference. What did Hansel say? Be quiet, be quiet. Compress. But what did you hear? What did you hear? Some people hear, oh, people are already moving. I don't need to. That's what you heard. But that's not what he said. He told people, compress. But you heard, oh, people are moving already. I don't need to move. But that's not what he said. So somebody can be teaching something, but you are hearing another thing. That's why Jesus said, you heard. He did not say, you were taught. You heard, but I say unto you. You choose what to hear. I choose what to teach. Okay? I choose what to teach. You choose what to hear. You know, one of the funny things that I observe as a preacher is this. There are certain portions in my teachings that people who are awake choose to sleep. You know, the worst thing that you can do is to close your eyes when you're awake. And sometimes when I am, some people will be, and it goes both ways, some people will be very sleepy. I teach on something and they will be wide awake. They like what they are hearing. Therefore, they choose it. You choose what to hear. You really choose what to hear. In fact, sometimes you say, well, I already know that. You, you shut your ears. You choose what to hear. Oh, that's the same teaching. You choose what to hear. This is one of the most frustrating things for somebody who's teaching. Parents complain about this all the time. When the parents say, it's time to eat, what happens to the kids? They jump, let's eat. They hear, it's time to eat. When the parent says, it's time to do the dishes, Mom, I'm doing my homework. Mom, I'm, 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 I'm tired. What did you, what were you told? Do the dishes. But you choose to hear something else. You heard yourself saying, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I need to sleep. You always choose what to hear. And so you cannot always blame what is being taught you really choose to hear. One of the worst things that happens to us and when, is when we are misquoted. The pastor will say, you said this. And I will begin saying, no, I did not say that. 
Because this is my complete statement. You take part of what I said. Because you choose to hear what you want to hear. Illustrate. The Bible teaches, uh, and I teach, the responsibility of raising your kids in the fear and in the knowledge of God. Whose role is that? Parents. Now, the Bible clearly teaches, I teach it also. Your responsibility is to raise your kids in the fear and in the knowledge of God. That responsibility was not given to the church or to the ministers. It was given to parents. Today, failing parents are always looking for others to blame. You know, I'll, I'll ask my kids, <clears throat> how's your grade? Joseph is no longer here, so I can, I can, I can use Joseph. Joseph, how's your grade? Well, I cannot understand my teachers. That's not my question. How's your grade? I can't, I can't understand my teachers. How's your grade? They blame the teachers. You know. But have you ever noticed this? The same teacher. He may be a bad teacher to you. The same teacher. A class of 20 students. One of the students is complaining. Bad teacher! He's getting D and E and F. You know. If there's a G, he will get a G, you know. But then on the other side, there are students in that same class who are getting an A. How come they are getting an A and you're getting a Z? Same teacher. The same teacher. Why is that? Well, you've got to find out yourself. But there are certain, when it comes to the kids, the responsibility of raising your kids in the fear and knowledge of God is on the parents, not on the church, not on the ministers, not on the temple, not on the rabbis. Because that command, raise your kids, is given to parents. What happens when the parents fail? They find somebody to blame. That's why when they ask my kids, how's your grade, and they are failing, they blame others. They say, oops, 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 oops. I'm not, I'm not telling you. For example, if I, if I tell a DJ, DJ, do this. And then I, for example, I, I say, DJ, prepare the table, you know. That was your responsibility before, right? I did not change it. It's still your responsibility, right? Uh, you moved out, okay? So that was a responsibility <laughs> to, to prepare a table. So, time for meal. And I'll say, DJ, prepare the table. And DJ will reluctantly say, yes, Papa. And she will stand in front of the table and do nothing. And she will begin to say, Dico, <laughs> watch this. James, move this. And the table is not prepared. I said, DJ, what happened? Well, washing the dishes is not mine, it's Deco's. Moving these things is not mine, it's James. But I said, but that is not what I said. I said, prepare the table. That means when I say prepare the table, do whatever it takes to prepare the table. You don't blame your Deco, you don't blame James. You're supposed to prepare the table the table. You see? You choose what to hear. And so you can, you can say, well, I can't do my homework because we have parties. No, you don't go to school for parties. I, I can't do my homework because my classmate has a problem. Well, it's none of your business. You know, so sometimes my kids will say, well, I have a classmate with a problem. Well, you didn't go there to solve their problems. You go there to finish your course. I mean, can you imagine parents who say, hey, DJ, I want you to go to school. You know, why, Papa? Well, I want you to solve your classmates' problems. <laughs> no, he, 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 she's going to school to earn a degree. Each to his own problem. You heard, but I say unto you. Okay? Today, 
we always have to remind ourselves we choose what to hear. You know, you cannot control what I teach, but you control what you hear. And so, again, what you don't like is for people to misquote you. And that's what we do all the time to God. Another way of looking at it is explain the New Testament. You can choose how to listen to the word. Filipinos are fond of saying this. Hindi or no. This is what it means. Worst is this. Now, we have experienced this in this church, right? And you see me react to this. Uh, DJ is asking question. Okay. She, he, she, and I'm here. She's asking me, Papa, let me clarify something. Blah, blah, blah. And, and I will say, DJ, what's your question? Suddenly, say John will butt in and say, Papa, this is what DJ means. I hate that response. What I always say is this, DJ is here. DJ, is that what you mean? Because she is here. Why does John need to clarify what she means? She is here. So I always say, DJ, is that what you mean? Because some people think it's their role to clarify other people's questions when you can't even frame your own question. I think we have to leave them alone. Especially if, if maybe you can ask if DJ is not articulate, maybe you can say, DJ, is this what you mean? And maybe DJ can agree, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. But when she is able to articulate her question, nobody should clarify. Because it's her question. What happens is we, we inject our own opinion. Filipinos are known for that. And sometimes I'll be saying something and somebody will stand up and say, well, this is what pastor is he, what pastor will say mean. No, I like to just cut that up and say, that's not what I mean and I'm here. Why, why do you have to clarify? Now, God said this, okay? God said this, you shall do the following thing. What did we say? Well, God really means this. Does God really mean that? You see? We begin to change things. Why do we do this? Because we choose to be smarter than we really are. And we choose to hear what we want to hear. I told you my illustration the first time the gift of speaking in other tongues and interpretation was manifested in the church was Bishop Ray Lere. The man was speaking in tongues and I was so excited. I was newly born again. I said, wow, this is what the Bible says. And I was very excited. He was speaking in tongues. And then he gave the interpretation. While he was giving the interpretation, the people were all rejoicing, clapping their hands, screaming at the top of their lungs, saying hallelujah. It upset me. I could not understand. Because when he started giving interpretation, the people thought they are supposed to shout while he's giving. Have you noticed what Paul says about that? When somebody is speaking, let the others remain silent so that everybody can understand each to his own turn. You know, what I don't like, for example, is I ask, John a question. The moment I ask John a question, Anne will ask him a question and DJ will butt in and everybody wants to ask a question. I keep quiet and says, I, I think I'm the one asking the question here. Because if you don't allow him to listen to my question, you decided to butt in and interfere. Nobody will understand. That's what the Bible says. You make a lot of noise. Nobody understands. That's why when somebody is speaking, when somebody ask, is asking a question, you've got to give them time. Because you heard, but I say unto you, the people begin to interpret the, 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 the truth of God. You know, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, it depends. 
Well, the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not commit adultery depending on. Well, pa Pastor said, what, what happened to my, my, my wife got old? And she's no longer pretty. You know, before she has a Coca-Cola bottle, body, now she has a family-sized Coke, you know, or a family-sized Pepsi. Well, the Bible says, thou shalt not commit... It didn't say, thou shalt not commit adultery when your wife is sexy. It didn't say, thou shalt not. But we begin to ask, well, my wife is sick. I have my needs. Well, it didn't say either that you can commit adultery the moment your wife is no longer able to satisfy you. It didn't say that. It just said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Therefore, God is saying something they are hearing something else. So the fault most of the time is in the hearing. Because the moment you hear wrong, you will do wrong. That's why it's in the hearing and doing of the word. Okay? Have you guys noticed when I am teaching and I say, when God created the first couple, Steve and Eve. Immediately, some people will say, Pastor will say, Adam and Eve. Why? Because I thought something wrong. But you know, because you were taught already it's Adam and Eve. Therefore, you, you heard Adam is still. And so you say, Adam and Eve, Pastor will say, we do the same thing. We change it when we don't like it. Hearing is critical. That's why the question for us is this. What kind of hearing do we have? Is our hearing still pure? Does it have the ability to receive the unadulterated word of God? You know, from time to time, if you are driving you have to change oil in your engine. Okay. What are you going to change that old oil with? New oil. Well, you don't, you don't just change oil. What else do you change? The filter. Why? Because if the filter is dirty already and you put new oil, that oil will pass through a dirty filter and it is dirty right away. Therefore, our spiritual ears are filters. If it's very dirty, no matter how much you are taught, you will hear something else. That's why parents say, how come my children are not listening to me anymore? Because their ears, their filters are dirty. They will no longer hear you. Or sometimes what you're giving is dirty. They will no longer receive it. That's why when Jesus started saying, you heard that it was said, thou shalt not murder. Jesus said, the fact is this, murder begins at the heart. Therefore, you guard your heart that you don't hate anybody. Because the moment you hate somebody, boy, you're willing to kill that person. You will do everything. You know, uh, I and I were in New York, and uh, there were Canadians. I think Canadians are French. We were transferring from one terminal to the other. We were, that was last year, Anne, right? Last February. So uh, I, we even get lost because the airport was big. And uh, when, we were, when we were there, so, some Canadians or French, they were, they were carrying American, little American flag. They're tourists. And they're, and they're saying, they're very happy. They were in the, in, the, in the airport and they're saying, your president is great. They're talking about Trump. Uh, your president is great. Make America great again in their, in their French accent or something. 
somebody was in the elevator, a Filipina, because I, I noticed. The Filipina says, no! We hate Trump! And it shocked this French. Because they thought Trump was doing a great job. But this Filipina from New York is screaming and saying, No, we hate Trump. Look at what she said. We hate Trump. Now you hate somebody like that. You commit murder. You see? Because we are not allowed to hate. You can disagree. You can, you can vote a person out, but you cannot hate. You see? I can, DJ can disagree with me, but she cannot hate me. You can dis, we can disagree with one another. We cannot hate each other. Because the moment you hate each other, murder, murder, it starts in the heart. In fact, Jesus said, puts it this way, the way he, and he's the author of the book, the way he puts it, hey, you can't even call your brother Raka or you fool, or you worthless one. You can't say that. You see? Because that is a manifestation of hatred. And the moment you hate somebody, the murderous intent begins. Everything starts with a root. The murderous intent. You know why this coronavirus is, is uh, very dangerous right now? They'll find a cure, I'm very sure. You know why it's very dangerous? Because it takes two to three months before it manifests that, that you are infected. But before they find out, you are already uh, contagious. They, they are announcing today something like 56,000 dead in China already because of this. Why? Because it's so sudden. It's already on you, but it takes two or three months before it can be manifested. You see, murder is like that. Murder does not begin by killing somebody. That's why you don't call soldiers in times of war murderers. They're soldiers. In fact, you watch documentaries now, they will say, you know, if we are living in a different time, we could be good friends. They have no murderous intent. They're depending on their countries. You see? But the moment you allow hatred in your heart, that is a murderous intent. It starts, it starts the process of murdering somebody. That's why Jesus arrested at the very foot. You heard, thou shalt not murder. But listen, you don't call a brother worthless. You don't call him a fool. Because the moment you allow that kind of simmering uh, uh, seething hatred in your heart, you will adopt an attitude that is very murderous. It will end up in murder. Look at what happened to Cain and Abel. So ask yourself, what kind of ears do you have? You know, I have, I have no problem with the law to this day. I honor my parents. I don't violate my wife and commit adultery. I still honor the seventh day. I have no problem with that. You know, I believe that Jesus died for me. He rose from the grave. So I know that I, I, I even have no problem with thou shalt not covet what your neighbor, thou shalt not steal. I love that commandment. I don't want anybody to steal from me. I have no problem with these things. You see? So you choose what you have. Make sure that you have the right ear. You don't have the right ear. You will always hear the wrong thing. Amen.